Mm-hmm. Welcome, Dr. Bussey. Oh, thank you. Um, I wanted this to be a follow-up interview, heart-to-heart talk. Okay. Like this fall, yeah. I will have the pleasure of um, directing the Ruby Bridges story, which thinking about Ruby, um, even from the book, uh, it reminds me of my mom mm-hmm. and my aunt. And when I look at you, I see both. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, with you and the impact that you have made, so mm-hmm. we know Ruby, mm-hmm. but I also want not only the students, but community of Columbus to know the impact that you made as being one of the first African-American students to integrate into Columbus High School. And it's a privilege for me to be able to share the experience because so many times our experiences don't get recorded or written down. Exactly. Yes. Yes. So Mm -hmm. we're now at the ninth grade Mm -hmm. year. Mm -hmm. Talk to me a little bit. One day you said you were in church. Yes. And and lead us through that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I wasn't really aware of what was going on in Columbus, Georgia around civil rights. My parents weren't activists. They were always concerned about safety and Mm -hmm. security. Mm Mm-hmm. Uh, But I had seen on television the college students, and also college students would come to the church Mm -hmm. and tell us about their experiences elsewhere, particularly in Alabama, Mm -hmm. um, with trying to integrate public facilities. Mm -hmm. And I know as a child, I was so frightened by the scenes that I would see on TV of fire hoses, Mm -hmm. dogs, Mm -hmm. billy clubs, racist epithets coming from people in charge, the, you know, uh, the, 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 the sheriff, uh, the governor, and so forth. These things were very frightening uh, mm-hmm. to me. It almost seemed like war, you know, mm-hmm. um, you know, that was always somewhere else, but it seemed like war right here. And so uh, I had seen those things, and it was very frightening, and I wondered, how did those college students do that, you know? Uh, and so I was sitting in church one day, and one of our members was A.J. McClung, who was a very prominent member of our church, but also a very prominent citizen here in Columbus in terms of being looked at as a black leader. He was in charge of the YMCA at the time and, and a member of the NAACP and so forth. And I was just sitting there, like I usually do, looking around for boys and stuff. <laughs> and um, he got up and spoke. And, you know, he has a commanding presence, so I paid attention. Mm. Uh, and he started talking about uh, the fact that there needed to be some immediate action. He was speaking to parents and, and, and uh, high schoolers that there was a deadline approaching mm. um, in about a month. Uh, and what needed to happen was, it was this concept called freedom of choice which meant that you would need to uh, apply to go to a white school. And he said that the powers to be in the city really didn't want to desegregate Mm. the schools. And they felt that black folks didn't really want to desegregate the schools. They felt that black people were happy with separate but equal. Mm. Um, but I knew separate was not equal. Mm-hmm. You know, I knew that from coming up and getting the used textbooks with white kids' names that were already torn up and marked up. And so he talked and he said, somebody has to do this. And I thought about those college students who were getting beaten and hosed and dogs sicked on them. And here was this man saying, we just want you to make application and go over there to the school. I said, well, I go to school every day. Um, I can do that. That's mm-hmm. the least I can do. Mm-hmm. So I I felt convicted. Do you remember the night before the first day at CHS? I'm I was very that. nervous because um, we hadn't had any preparation, really. You uh-huh. know? Um, uh-huh. And um, what, what, what had been decided, there were about 12 of us in my class, but about six of us lived in the same general area. Okay. Three of us lived on the same street, okay. paradoxically. Okay. Um, and so uh, 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 the parents of the six, uh, of three of three of the parents decided mm. that they would take responsibility for getting us to school. Well, there was no transportation mm. provided, so we had to be taken to school because riding the bus to school wasn't really viable at that time. The city bus, mm. and there was no transportation. Mm-hmm. And I remember getting there and being let out on the corner because the school sits up on a hill. Right. And there's this real steep hill that has the stairs from uh-huh. the sidewalk to the top. Yep. And I remember getting there and looking at those stairs and being fearful about what would be at the top of those stairs. And if people were at the top of the uh-huh. stairs who would push me 
all the way down those concrete stairs once I got there. That was my fear. So, you know, I sort of took a deep breath, and we all trudged up there and went in there. Mm -hmm. It wasn't like other places, um, like what we had seen um, when Ruby Ridges, Mm -hmm. you know, went to school. There were no parents standing outside with signs and effigies of babies and yelling Mm -hmm. racial epithets. Mm -hmm. There there was none of that. Mm -hmm. Nobody was outside. There were no uh, police or, you know, uh, uh, guards, anybody out there. And so we walked on in there. And when we got in there, you know, it was clearly a situation where our presence wasn't welcome, um, but it was mainly verbal, um, you know, the N-word, and it also was um, when you walk down the hall, people would sort of just throw themselves against the lockers that were on the, the hall, try to keep keep from having space any kind of mm-hmm. space. It's like, it was almost like COVID, you know, mm-hmm. six, six feet apart. Mm-hmm. Uh, so you felt that presence. So we, you know, that's kind of how it was. We were assigned and uh, pretty much we, with the exception of one class that I had, we were separated from each other. So mm-hmm. we might be the only black person in the class. What was that like? Um, it was at first... Um, it was isolating, yeah, um, because you didn't have anybody to talk to, and all you would hear is all this buzz around, and you weren't really sure whether the teacher was a person that you could trust and prote- would protect you, mm-hmm. or not mm-hmm. if something happened. So it was tense. It was intense every day, mm-hmm. um, and you know you had to learn how to tune out things that you would hear, and not think about having a friend. Not think about having a friend. And, you know, that was the biggest difference because I grew, you know, I had gone to school with people I grew up with. Some people I had gone to school from kindergarten. Yeah. And now here I was in this place where I would look around and nobody knows my name and doesn't want to know my name. They only call me the N-word. Um, and they're not interested in me even being there. So it was intense. So that first year was the most difficult for me, not academically, but the social and social adjustment the first year was the most difficult it got better as time passed on Uh, and I think one of the reasons it got better was because we kind of shattered prejudices and prejudgments and so forth um, things that had been instilled in some of those students about who black people are and what black people were like Mm -hmm. Uh, because we felt we were representing our race uh, we the first wave of us who went through, we really tried to to do what people used to call be a credit to our race. Mm. Uh, so we would dress nicely. Uh, we were all very smart because they didn't accept anybody from Carver mm-hmm. or mm-hmm. Spencer who wasn't smart mm-hmm. already. Mm-hmm. So they had kind of creamed uh, the, the applicants and mm-hmm. got folks who... The kids were smart, and the parents had some some skin in the game and could lose something mm. uh, if there was any untoward uh, behavior from any of us. Mm-hmm. Uh, like my mother was a teacher, mm-hmm. you know that, and several of the others had teachers for mothers. Their employment could be in jeopardy, you know, should we, you know, right. act out. Mm-hmm. Um, the only person who who was impacted by losing their job was one of my good friends. I had two good friends there that I developed. Her mother was a, a maid for one of the families, um, uh, wh- whose children, in fact, her her um, daughter, the daughter, attended was in our class at Columbus High School, mm. and they told the grandmother that she needed to get her granddaughter to withdraw her application and not come to Columbus High School, uh, or she would lose her job, and the grandmother was very concerned about that, and she talked to my friend. Uh, but my friend told her that she felt she needed to do this. Mm. And so she did. And the grandmother did lose her job. Um, and we, we, would, we would have to go to study hall that was in the auditorium. And when we would come in study hall, there would always be like four rows ahead and four rows behind that people wouldn't sit if we came in. They would so move we, out of the way. They, they would move out of the way. You know, uh, if we came and sat down, they would move. Mm-hmm. And so we would, the first year, it was like that. The second year, I remember very clearly the first day a white kid, a white girl, came up to me in study hall and said, 
can you help me? It was for algebra. She said, I'm not doing very well, and you're doing very well. Would you help me during study hall? Mm -hmm. And, you know, that was just, what? Mm -hmm. so I said, yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. And so she sat down, and I started helping her. Um, and then a few others came over, you know. Um, but I think that, you know, they had been brought up to believe we were dirty, mm -hmm. that we were ignorant, mm -hmm. and so forth. Mm -hmm. And so those, those concepts got shattered a bit. I gave a little talk over at Columbus High School um, on, our, on the occasion of our 50th class reunion. Mm -hmm. And I was so grateful that the principal was open to having us come and talk about that because mm -hmm. a lot of the kids had no concept. And I was grateful to walk into that school and see all kinds of kids, all descriptions, shades, gender identifications and everything in there. And they were all getting along together. Mm -hmm. And um, and I like that, you know. Mm -hmm. And I and I guess I would say to kids that I've tried to put in perspective not only what the racial climate was, but the fact that we were all teenagers. And that's kind of what I've said to some of the white kids who are now adults and grown people who have come up to me at reunions. I only started going to reunions after 50 years. I just couldn't go before that. Uh, and they had thought about what happened, and they were very sorry. And one of the things I've said to them and one of the things i said to the current students at Columbus High School is that we were all kids. We were all 14, 15, 16, 17 years old. Uh, and we were going through adolescence. And some of those behaviors had to do with immaturity and adolescence and trying to find identity. Um, but I would say that if you find yourself different, that doesn't mean that there's anything wrong with you, that there's a tribe for you somewhere. And if you don't find your tribe in high school, mm -hmm. know that there's a tribe for you somewhere. Mm -hmm. Just keep on being who you are. Mm -hmm. Okay? Mm -hmm. Be true to yourself, the best you that you can be, mm -hmm. and you will find your tribe. Mm -hmm. Wow. Okay. Mm -hmm. I, I think that's, that's it. Okay. But just thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Just thank you. And I'll say it. I consider you a mentor now. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so, and I and it I know it's not easy to have mm -hmm. to go back and relive some of those moments. So, mm -hmm. thank you. And I don't want this to be the last conversation you and I have. Well, it won't be. <laughs>